I'd like to welcome you all to the, uh, this year's Paul A. Witherspoon Lecture. This is a mid-career award lecture that celebrates the career of Paul Witherspoon. And today we have a, a, a short agenda. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you. Uh, on behalf of my co-convener, Scott Tyler, my name is Jeff McDonald. I'm the president of the hydrology section, and this is my last official act, so it's a, it's a delight to be with you. Uh, and today, we're going to first start with a presentation of one of the three Horton Research Grants. Due to a scheduling error on my part, uh, we were, weren't able to do this at the business meeting, but Brianna has graciously agreed to uh, come and accept the award that I'll present momentarily. Then we'll have the citation for the Witherspoon Lecture from Judd Harvey, and, and then, of course, the, uh, the, the lecture from Beth. And this, we have one hour block for this. So again, thanks for, for joining us, and we look forward to an exciting afternoon. But it is my distinct pleasure now to uh, introduce um, Brianna Pagan from Ghent University. Uh, Brianna is a PhD student, and it, for, most of you will know the Horton Research Grant. This is a part of a, a, an endowment given to the hydrology section. We award three of these per year now, and uh, Brianna is, was one of these three winners for best PhD proposal. Uh, in, in hydrology. This is a $10,000 award. This is quite a significant achievement, uh, and it's a pleasure to welcome her to the stage to receive her award. And we'll take photos later with, with both uh, Beth and Brianna. Okay, so that is, uh, takes us to our, our next uh, event in the agenda, and I'd like to welcome uh, Judd Harvey up to read the citation for the, the Witherspoon Award. Thanks, Jeff. This is a real pleasure to introduce Dr. Elizabeth Boyer. Beth found her calling early in uh, threatened water resources of forested watershed, and she stayed true to it, a big reason why she's standing here before you today. As a graduate student, she was undeterred by that first big bang of acid rain research, the fact that it was on the, on the wane, and the funding pull was from uh, contaminant hydrogeology. She, uh, she resisted that and uh, boosted her, herself tremendously as a postdoc by joining the great minds who were setting the stage and to define global modeling of the, to the, of the fate and transport of human-caused nitrogen contamination. And I'm talking like, of people like Sybil Seitzinger, Jim Galloway, Gene Likens, and Robert Howarth. Since then, she's been a professor at three universities, and her team has undertaken the critical data synthesis and creative modeling that was needed to pull, put the full context necessary to define nitrogen source estimation, quantify the removal efficiencies of denitrification globally, and link it to the carbon cycle in field-based process studies. I've just got a few phrases, uh, phrases to describe Elizabeth Boyer. Committed to big questions that scale from locales to the nation to the world. A magnetic leader, educator, mentor, and colleague. Impossible to detract from her mission. An unselfish collaborator that believes as much in public service as she does in advancing scientific frontiers. Did I already mention impossible to detract from her mission? Yeah, again, that's why she stands here before you. Please join me in congratulating her in being elected AGU's 2018 Witherspoon Lecturer. Beth. Well, thank you. Thank you all for coming, and thank you, Judd, for that kind uh, introduction. 
I wanted to start out with some acknowledgements because indeed it takes a village. I've been very fortunate to work with some incredible mentors along the way, including my advisor, George Hornberger at the University of Virginia, and some great mentors at the US Geological Survey, um, including Judd Harvey, um, Ken Bencala, Diane McKnight, George Aiken, and others. I also listed up here some of my students and postdocs who I've uh, enjoyed working with, as well as uh, collaborators and colleagues, including some who've provided um, scientific kindness, which is very important in terms of mentoring, advice, opportunities, as well as collaborators. I also wanted to start by acknowledging a man I never met. This lecture honors the life of Paul Witherspoon, who was a dynamic and influential leader throughout his um, distinguished career in the hydrologic sciences. Paul spent his career at UC Berkeley and at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, where he initiated the Earth Sciences Division of the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab and served as its first director. He left a legacy as one of the world's great hydrologists. Most of his work was in fate and transport of contaminants in the subsurface and hydrogeology. He was known for identifying important problems, finding the resources to work on them, communicating clearly, and collaborating across disciplinary and geographic boundaries. I didn't know Paul, but I feel some connections. He and I both grew up in Pennsylvania. We both served on the faculty at Berkeley. And I got my start in hydrology at one of the national labs, at Pacific Northwest National Labs, where I did an internship as an undergraduate that got me interested in hydrology. So I appreciate the opportunity to give this lecture. I picked a big topic, <laughs> the water quality of America's waters. I'm really focusing on water in the nation and uh, just have some general thoughts. I'll start out by giving some perspectives on water quality, talk about some advances in water quality data and analyses, then talk about nitrogen pollution, one of my favorite elements, as an informative uh, example, and with some policy relevant examples and some parting thoughts. It's really a broad overview talk because that's all you can fit in in this short amount of time we have. I realize here that this um, clock is not ticking, so um, you'll have to help me to stay on time. I've got my clock here. Good thing I brought my star alarm clock. <laughs> so I'll start out by talking about uh, the nature of water resources issues. Um, world population is growing. The US population is growing. We have uh, lots of different needs and demands for our water resources. Watersheds, they are the resources that we want to manage, conserve, restore. I wanted to talk about watersheds as integrators of human activities, natural activities, and all the effects of things that are going on, processes on the landscape. Watersheds are intrinsic connections uh, between land and water in relation to flow and solutes and other materials at all scales, from headwater uplands to coastal lowlands. Our goal is to be able to predict and understand hydrologic and also solute responses in systems at multiple scales. Downstream water quality is the result of cumulative contributions and effects of land use and hydro, bio, geo, uh, all sorts of processes in headwater drainages and in river networks. So the nature of water resources issues span as many scales as do watersheds. Just some general primary interests of our community, our use and consumption of fresh waters, aquatic ecosystem productivity and health, things like algal blooms and trophic status, causes and effects of altered hydrological and elemental cycles, other concerns, emerging contaminants, organic pollution, and the ecosystem goods and services that our natural systems provide or have the potential to provide. Some drivers of change to water quality are population, land use, climate changes, agriculture and producing food and feed to feed the world, energy development and combustion to fuel the world, uh, and regulatory and legal frameworks, including governance, development of things like nutrient criteria, and jurisdiction um, of, of 
waters under the Clean Water Act. I wanted to give a window into the nation's water quality, and it's interesting doing a little digging around trying to find some big picture generalizations. And in fact, uh, one starting point is the EPA's website where the states under the Clean Water Act have to assess the water quality in the context of designated uses of their rivers, lakes, streams, and other water bodies. And it's interesting to go to this site and see how poor the information is presented and how difficult it is to obtain, thinking about the perspective that this might be the first stop that a policymaker would make looking for information about water quality. Uh, but nonetheless, you get information like this uh, from the Attains database, looking at leading causes of impairment of water quality across the nation for any given state, the number of rivers and stream miles. The first thing that points out is how few of our waters are actually assessed. In my home state of Pennsylvania, most of our waters are assessed at this point, uh, but across the nation, the average um, is about 31% of our waters have been assessed for water quality. But in terms of the ones that have been assessed, um, there's statistics on what they've been impaired for, and um, the states have to prioritize those impaired water bodies and think about management plans to um, get them back to health, to support their designated uses, to protect human health, and aquatic life. A window into the nation's water quality from USGS provides a little more depth into what's going on. Um, in fact, it, it begs uh, for more uh, relationships between sharing of generalized information from the National Water Quality Assessment Program and other programs within the USGS with the EPA's um, first stop for data. Uh, the National Water Quality Assessment Program um, highlights at a nationwide scale through various methods of assessment uh, increases in nutrient loadings from ag and urban landscapes result in nutrient concentrations in many streams and parts of aquifers that exceed the standards for protection of human health or aquatic life, often by large margins. Nitrate concentrations are greater than federal drinking water standards uh, are uncommon in streams that are used for drinking water or from relatively deep aquifers, but for aquifers that are less than 100 feet deep, especially in agricultural regions, uh, there are many, many violations of the maximum contaminant levels for nitrate, which um, that poses some risks for people living in rural agricultural areas on private water supplies. I wanted to um, just also mention here how lucky we are in the United States to have the U.S. Geological Survey and the U.S. EPA looking over our waters and trying to assess them in a systematic way. The USGS has had a long tradition of measuring all the things we need to do to understand status and trends of water quality, including importantly, the measurement of discharge and the measurement of concentrations of a whole range of solutes and sediments um, over time and over space of the country. I can't emphasize enough the value to our hydrologic sciences community, the observational data the long-term data and also that it's collected systematically with excellence in terms of methodology in the field and in the lab. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the data um, availability of discharge and concentration observations. Effective management of water resources relies on understanding how water quality conditions are changing over time and space. And the USGS and other agencies who collect data on water quality provide a treasure trove of observational data to see what's happening. And a pretty substantial um, interaction among agencies that takes time and collaboration and money. Uh, there's a fairly new national water quality um, portal that's aiming to synthesize information of our various agencies and make it easier to obtain a really um, amazing effort. Um, here's an example of some data that a graduate student and I, he actually works for the USGS, um, John Clune, uh, pulled together trying to synthesize lots of information for the state of Pennsylvania on discharge and concentration so that we could think about water quality statewide for a number of solutes. I'm focusing here mainly on nutrients. 
the National Water Information System, Storette, EPAs, the USGS's EPAs, and then the National Water Quality Portal, and also Kwasi were four places that we pulled together information from. I wanted to point out the challenges with synthesizing large data sets so that you can work on um, regionalizing water quality or with um, data intensive methods um, any sort of modeling method. For example, pulling together data from multiple agencies like this, there are lots of duplicate data that at first glimpse might have something different with the way they're entered, so they're not so easy to flag. There are sites that have incorrect latitudes and longitudes, sites that have parameters that are listed as different things, yet they're the same parameter. Um, parameters that are listed the same that aren't measured the same way. And the list goes on. It's very challenging. You can't just pull together all the data and run some analyses on it and expect it to give you a correct window into what's happening. The amount of screening that had to take place here and the amount of routines we had to write in order to flag problems were substantial. So there are still challenges with synthesizing and compiling data despite huge advances in an availability of information. The figure on the right just shows some patterns of the amount of data that we pulled together for some key nutrients in Pennsylvania's waters, nitrogen and phosphorus, over the seasons, over the years, showing you that there's um, big seasonality in addition to big changes in magnitudes. I also want to talk about some other challenges with the value of long-term data. This is a pretty old graphic that Jared Bales sent me over 10 years ago, <laughs> but I didn't have time to update it. But the essence of what I wanted to say is the same here. There's information here from different databases, from the National Water Information System, from Storette, um, old and new, and the total on the top. So there's some double accounting here. But the point is that over time, the amount of information for this uh, particular parameter shown here, nitrate in streams, has gone up as more money has come to these programs and has gone down as um, money has left these programs. And uh, it makes it challenging without having um, consistent numbers of observations. There's also additional concerns for modeling of uh, water quality where you need to understand both the flow and the concentration. It's hard to generalize, but in every single modeling exercise that I've done with collaborators to think about regional patterns of water quality over space and time, we've had lots and lots of sites, say a thousand sites, for solute X that we want to model. And half of them we can't use, or more, because they aren't co-located, the flow and the concentration measurements, or because there aren't enough measurements to be able to statistically estimate any sort of meaningful pattern over time with the information we have. Um, stream flow and mass flux are required. Um, so I wanted to give a shout out to Bob Hirsch, uh, who gave the Langbein lecture last year, I believe, uh, who spent quite a bit of time in recent years helping our community think about how to sensibly estimate loads. This is a huge service to our community, and a lot of the work that's been done previously um, could benefit from a relook with new methods to look at loads calculated in a hydrologically um, reasonable way. Um, this, this technique, um, WRTDS, which has become like a household acronym in most um, hydrologist um, labs these days, um, is a statistical model used to calculate trends in concentration and fluxes of stream flow and water quality. It's a perfect tool for exploratory data analysis. It's quantitative. There's lots of different ways that you can analyze the data looking at um, actual time series, histories of concentrations or flows, or flow normalized, flow weighted histories, detrended um, histories, uh, and so on. It's also very visual. There's lots and lots of different visual outputs that you can provide with the different um, opportunities within each package and the different versions of the package. Um, this package is available in an R version called Egret. I uh, want to make sure everybody knows about it, gets it, learns it, and uses it. It's well documented, and it's um, a fantastic advance in our field. 
And so a lot of the most excellent work that I could find that's been published, and most of it recently, to generalize understanding of water quality at a national scale has made use of this tool, and I wanted to give a few examples. This excellent paper by Lori Sprague and Jennifer Murphy uh, on water quality trends in rivers, exploring effects from streamflow trends and changes in watershed management. This was a creative exercise to use all the information based on the observations. So there's no catchment modeling here. This is looking at the stream flow um, concentrations and trends and with a creative technique using the WRTDS package and some other uh, methods combined, we're able to think about the role of um, watershed management um, causing changes in a watershed over time versus the changes of stream flow and its seasonality and variances over time. Very creative use. Similarly, um, this paper on the right by Megan Shoda, Lori Sprague, also Jennifer Murphy, and Melissa Riskin looked at water trends in US rivers in relation to levels of concern. This is what people want to know. Is our water impaired with regard to our water quality criteria um, or aquatic life criteria? And again, made use of the WRTDS framework. What was really nice about these applications is they weren't just estimating loads. They were doing it in the context of understanding the impacts of change in one case, the impacts of um, impairment with regard to um, in the criteria of, of intended use in the other. Another recent paper that's very recent, Gretchen Olsner and Ted Stetz, was recent trends in nutrient and sediment loads to coastal areas of the U.S. Uh, this paper, which just came out, looked at decadal scale trends in riverine nutrient and sediment loads to coastal waters. Nitrogen loading decreased at more coastal sites than phosphorus loading, especially in urban areas. Um, despite the fact that nitrogen concentrations have been coming down um, feeding these um, systems, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, what's interesting about this is that they looked at trends in a um, statistically sensible way in different major river basins of the country, which I've tried to illustrate here with a figure from their paper. Um, so it, it, it's very helpful to see decreases, uh, for example, in nitrogen, increases in phosphorus in the Chesapeake Bay region done statistically um, well that we can use this information for management. Which brings me to think more about my example on nitrogen pollution. Nitrogen pollution is a pervasive, long-term legacy water quality problem that's growing in its importance around the world. Um, nitrogen pollutes our rivers, lakes, and streams, as does phosphorus. It tends to be, um, in general, a key limiting nutrient in coastal waters, so it's a big concern thinking about the inputs of nitrogen from upstream waters to the coastal zone. It helps to fuel hypoxia um, and other problems with algal blooms um, around the world. So nitrogen is an interesting example because it's very soluble, it moves with the water, and it's related to a whole host of environmental problems. Uh, and it's also a great illustration of uh, a problem in our field that is truly at the food, energy, water nexus. Um, so for example, we introduce nitrogen in the, into the environment by combustion of fossil fuels and producing energy and biofuels, and also by producing food, um, growing crops, growing animals, meat, milk, and eggs. Um, and we introduce it also um, synthetically by the Haber-Bosch process by producing synthetic nitrogen fertilizers meant to be reactive nitrogen to help grow food. Then that reactive nitrogen enters the food system or enters the atmosphere through emissions and cascades through ecosystems in a famous concept now coined originally by Jim Galloway and Jack Cosby called the nitrogen cascade. And the idea is that a single molecule of nitrogen moving through the ecosystem can have multiple effects as it moves through the atmosphere where it's related to all sorts of problems of the day from ground level ozone and particulate matter to when it enters the terrestrial landscape affecting acidity of soils and nitrogen saturation of sensitive high elevation um, ecosystems um, and also like uh, ozone, ground level ozone damage to vegetation also in um, sensitive ecosystems. 
And of course, the water impacts. It's implicated in elevated acidification of surface waters, groundwater pollution and contamination, and over-enrichment of coastal zones. There's lots and lots of different ways to tally nitrogen, from mechanistic models to complete budgets that aren't actually doing um, uh, that same kind of modeling. Um, at the global scale, at the country scale, there's a huge interest in tallying um, nitrogen and doing the accounting. There was a major meeting here and a major session here at the conference focused on this earlier this week. Uh, some of the popular approaches are net anthropogenic or net total net nitrogen inputs, newly created reactive nitrogen, or a surface balance. These are just different ways of tallying the inputs to the system that are uh, popular um, for global agricultural um, comparisons, for the United States assessments, for the European assessments, and in the ecological community for thinking about anthropogenic impacts. You define the inputs and the outputs differently depending, of course, on your question of interest, just like with any great hydrological model. Um, also, there's a lot of interest in regional or watershed scale nitrogen modeling approaches, and there's a myriad of models that are being used at different scales and for different purposes to look at the nitrogen um, pollution and other water quality pollution problems. There's some trends recently in modeling toward parsimonious model structures, which makes me happy, uh, parameter estimation and uncertainty quantification, spatial explicitness, since we have so much data to work with, um, modular component modeling and scenario development. All of the models, whether you're using mass balance accounting approaches or any of the types of um, watershed models listed here need to have information on the drivers of inputs um, or outputs and processing in these watersheds. So I thought I would just take a quick tour through, and it'll be very quick <laughs> to stay on track here. Um, one of the key inputs, and part of the idea here is to think about uh, the interdisciplinary science that's needed in order to understand the nutrient pollution um, water quality problem. You have to have information on everything. Um, so we're thinking about synthetic fertilizers here, also the heterogeneity of the soil landscape with changes in C to N ratios of soil and soil storage capacity, tile drainage and um, other uh, man-made ways of getting water off agricultural landscapes, conservation practices and uh, legacy effects that are a function of um, transmissivity and its heterogeneity in soils are big important parts of characterizing the response. Fertilizer data, you would think it would be easy to come by. It's very hard to come by. Uh, and there's um, a, a lot of error in the fact that we have to make the assumption that fertilizer use is somehow parallel to fertilizer sales. Our best information on fertilizer um, to, that's coming into a part of the landscape is based on county level sales data translated. Um, and if you compare various databases that you can get your hands on, proprietary ones uh, versus free ones from our USGS, county by county, they don't stack up perfectly for the same time frame, which makes um, some questions there. There's also um, information on the type of fertilizer applied, which might be relevant. There's some science that suggests that forms of fertilizer, uh, one form or another, might uh, preferentially uh, be implicated in algal blooms or harmful algal blooms, for example. I would say that's controversial research. There's more needed, but there's some evidence of that. Similarly, understanding rates of nitrogen fixation. We're planting crops cultivating crops across the landscape um, that are designed to fix nitrogen, things like alfalfa, soybeans, um, other legumes. And most of these approaches consider number of acres of alfalfa grown or some other metric of the crops on the landscape. Uh, and we're trying to assign rates to think about the amount of nitrogen created by cultivating nitrogen fixing crops. And there's a lot of uh, variability among the modelers uh, in the types of coefficients that you would use. For example, does a soybean acre fix 100 kilograms of hectare per nitrogen per year? How variable is that over um, the seasons or over a region? 
Uh, there's just as much um, controversy in the community about how to tally nitrogen. How much does a human consume? Uh, they consume more than they need. How much does a cow or uh, uh, any other sort of livestock um, consume? How much do they excrete? There's databases on these. Our group has compared them. Other groups have compared them. We've gotten our um, rates together and it matters the assumptions that you make about these things and there's potentially better information available f locally by tapping into groups like uh, extension parts of universities who are actually measuring these things in the right conditions in their states than the data that we're using at national scales, for example. We've made the calculations if the rates are this or that and show that it absolutely does matter in the calculations in these agricultural lands, the rates of fixation, the rates you're assuming for waste um, excretion from humans, from livestock. Manure is a big thing. It's a huge part of the problem for ag management. And uh, this is a really uncertain term. Uh, there's the human waste end, which is an uncertain term, but manure is also uncertain. Just to give you an idea um, of the uncertainty, the US EPA has two different databases that have information on the amount of manure tallied across the nation. One is from the Greenhouse Gas Emissions Inventory, and one is from the uh, Ag Census, the so Census of Agriculture. And if you pull those data together for one of the years that we did, they were off by 0.6 teragrams of nitrogen for that same year, from the same agency for the same country. So which is right? 0.6 teragrams is a lot of nitrogen to be messing around with. And there's a lot of problems with these county level data to begin with, with disclosure and availability uh, that make things challenging. Atmospheric end deposition is another important source, and we have better data on that than some of these other sources. Um, our U.S. Environmental Protection Agency calculated a national nitrogen inventory um, fairly recently uh, for the year 2002. And one of the things that we can see is that anthropogenic sources were much, much accelerated over natural sources. And it begs the um, question about what we need to do about this problem and what we can do at a national scale versus what the states have to do and, and so on. I wanted to shift gears now and talk about a few policy relevant examples. One is changes in acidic atmospheric deposition as a function of policy, partially because we're here in Washington, D.C., and these are some policy relevant pieces of the nutrient water quality problem that I wanted to think about. One of the major policy success stories has been in regulating emissions through a cap and trade program that targeted mostly coal-fired power plants. That's referred to as Title IV of the Clean Air Act Amendments of 1990 and the follow-on programs. And since 1990, we've seen declines in atmospheric deposition. What you're looking at here is sulfate deposition on the top, nitrogen deposition on the bottom. Collectively, the inputs of atmospheric deposition from these two sources are considered to be acidic inputs to um, catchments. Um, and it, on the left, you see a period of time averaged around 1990, and on the right, you see around 2010. And it's just visually stunning how effective these emissions reductions um, policies have been. Pennsylvania, my home state, back in the 70s as well as in the 90s, uh, was the highest spot in the nation for rates of atmospheric nitrogen deposition, and those rates have come down greatly uh, because of this sensible um, science-based, data-based um, set of policies. <laughs> and what we have seen in Pennsylvania, I uh, run a network of monitoring sites for atmospheric deposition across the state of Pennsylvania. And the data that are shown here are from the very center of the state, site PA42, which is at the Shale Hills Critical Zone Observatory, which many of you catchment scientists are working at. And what we can see at this site, which has been monitored long term, it's one of the oldest atmospheric deposition monitoring sites in the nation, is pH of precipitation, shown here. And in response to those emissions reductions that we could see here, we see some chemical recovery of precipitation. This is not just limited to the site in Pennsylvania. We've seen it all across the Northeast, as all the sites, synchronous behavior in terms of their response to these reductions. 
So pH values have recovered to pretty good levels for the ecosystem. Um, also in Pennsylvania, I wanted to point out that over time, precipitation is trendy, but it has not had a trend um, up or down, right? Precipitation has stayed about the same. We get about 41 inches of rain in Pennsylvania per year, every year, a little bit higher in the wet years, a little bit lower in the dry years. But in response to those emissions reductions, we've seen the concentrations come down so, so much that as they're weighted by the flow of precipitation, the deposition values have seen statistically significant decreases for just about every um, major macro element that in precipitation over time. Um, that's not true for mercury, for example. There the concentrations have come down, but the loads are still high because it's a trace element in rain. But anyway, hydrogen, um, related of course here to pH, sulfate, nitrate um, have all come down. These are good directions for thinking about acidic um, inputs to catchments that are implicated in nitrogen um, releases from landscapes. So many of us in the forest watershed community have been measuring our catchments um, across our states, thinking about the question of, okay, since emissions have come down and concentrations have come down, how are streams doing? Are they recovering? There's lots of this work going on. These are two streams in, in Pennsylvania that are acid sensitive streams. They're not well buffered um, geologically that would uh, mitigate the inputs of the, the acids like some catchments are in the state. Uh, but so in these acid sensitive catchments, We've seen the deposition rates come down, and we've seen stream flow concentrations of the acidifying compounds like sulfate um, and nitrate come down um, in the streams. And so the streams have responded uh, by showing some chemical recovery. However, the acidification has caused changes in the base cation status of the soil, which has also affected base cations and other um, ions being delivered to the streams. And so Pennsylvania's acid-sensitive streams, like many in the Northeast, have not seen changes in their acid neutralizing capacity to come back to levels that would allow for recovery of biological communities that were documented to be there in the long past in these regions. This is what we're seeing at those sites in Pennsylvania is also um, seen at other locations in the Northeast and in acid sensitive um, regions of the country that are monitored in uh, programs by the US EPA. Interestingly, it's not the clean water um, interest, but it's the clean air markets division that funds a lot of the catchment science research in forested catchments to look at recovery in um, acid sensitive parts of the country. Clean air markets division is keenly interested in having information on the ground to show that their policies are having positive environmental benefits and they've made great use of the science from our hydrologic science community. There's a really great exchange of information between policymakers in the Clean Air Markets Division at EPA and scientists all over the country who are working in catchments. It's a pretty cool relationship. Uh, so I wanted to point out this beautiful article by Tim Sullivan, Charlie Driscoll, and others that pulled together information from across the country over time that pointed out in a very coherent way air pollution success stories in the United States, the value of long-term observations, focusing on the importance of the atmospheric deposition monitoring as well as the stream flow concentration and discharge monitoring in small catchments, acid-sensitive ones, um, across the country. They weren't only focusing on this paper on um, acidity, but also other things like mercury. It's worth a read. Um, Sparrow, I don't have time uh, much to talk about, but it's one of my favorite models. Uh, also a USGS um, product. It was based on um, an expansion of a really nice idea in an old paper, I think it was, I don't know, 1997, by Dick Smith that was called something like the Regional Interpretation of Water Quality, published in WRR. And that paper um, and its conceptual framework led to this uh, modeling framework, which has continued to grow, called Sparrow. 
And uh, it's a useful framework, a statistical framework, for synthesizing vast amounts of information about the landscape. There's information about inputs um, that would be surrogates for um, patterns of sources or drivers of a solute of interest. There's information about, over the space of the mosaic of the landscape, about land to water delivery variables. These are things like soil characteristics, anything that affects transmissivity that would enhance or retard the movement of a solute to the stream. There's representation of the reach network, including wetlands, lakes, um, impoundments, and the stream channel itself, and its width, and its depth, and its characteristics, to think about how, once solutes arrive in the stream, how they're transported and transformed along the flow network. And you can simulate based on the, again, observed data. You absolutely have to have observations on the ground using a flow routine like egrets um, and the WRTDS framework in order to estimate the loads uh, that you're calibrating to. And you're calibrating all your predictions at ungaged locations to um, the number of degrees of freedom you have based on observations at sites. But anyway, we've made use of this technique to explore a whole range of questions, as have others. There's info code documentation on the web at the USGS site, and there's a lot more coming, exciting stuff that the USGS is about to release in our version of Sparrow, a version that's parameterized with Bayesian uh, methods and so on, are forthcoming in the new year. Anyway, one application that's policy relevant that I wanted to highlight here was how we used Sparrow to look at the effect of small streams on downstream waters. Uh, here, just for plotting, we've used Strayler stream orders as a way to think about headwaters being number one, the smallest unbranched manifestations of the stream network. Um, so the smallest headwater streams here to the largest rivers on the right. And as with any watershed, there's a high density of first order streams. This particular exercise focused on the northeast region of the United States. It's hard to see there. But um, so all the stream reaches in the northeast, taking a look at nitrogen discharge. Um, and one of the things that we wanted to do with this um, tool was play some games, turning on and off the headwaters, looking at differences, um, just to think with uh, the mathematics of the model, what it would say about the importance of headwater streams on downstream water. And what we can see is that headwater streams collectively contribute very large percentages of the nitrogen load and the stream flow load in streams of all sizes um, in the Northeast United States. So there's a huge percentage of mean annual stream flow that comes from upstream areas, like 60%, and like 50% of the nitrogen flux delivered to downstream waters originated in headwaters. It makes sense conceptually, but this is a tool that we were able to use to get an estimate of it quantitatively which is very relevant to some um, alarming uh, new news that came out this week. A uh, proposal by the Trump administration announced Tuesday that would change EPA's definition of the waters of the United States rule, limiting the types of waterways that fall under federal protection to major waterways, their tributaries, adjacent wetlands, and a few other changes. There are so many people here at AGU who've been working on this question for many years. There were sessions convened about it um, earlier in the week. There was talks about it at the Catchment Science Symposium yesterday. So this isn't new news to many of the people in the room. In fact, some of them were expecting this kind of thing and have already written papers about the implications of this policy change, including a paper by Irina Creed shown here. But the point is that vast amounts of streams and wetlands would no longer be federally protected under the Clean Water Act under this new proposal. Estimates based on the National Hydrography data set, which is another amazing resource that we should all be so thankful for our agencies cooperating on, um, might pull back federal oversight of EPA's estimates of about 51% of wetlands and about 18% of streams. Those numbers, by all means, are uncertain, but they were estimates that were made um, in a in advance of this, um, thinking about what might um, be affected. Um, the literature, uh, there's a beautiful report fairly recently released by US EPA, uh, led by Laurie and Heather Golden and 
Judd, you were part of that, others, um, that looked at connectivity of streams and wetlands to downstream waters, a review and synthesis of the scientific evidence. EPA's best scientist spent a lot of time working on this report. I remember it was controversial back in March when they were trying to get papers published because after March, you had to get special permission to publish a paper with the C word, not climate, connectivity, right? And, um, and so um, these, these studies, and there's a whole lot of them here. Uh, I also wanted to give a shout out to Fred Chang, who won one of the Horton Awards. Um, Nandita, Nandita Basu's um, student has a beautiful paper about the role of small water bodies in landscape nutrient processing, which won um, WRR's Editor's Choice Award uh, recently. And some other papers here including one of mine with Judd. <laughs> and uh, the idea here is that streams, regardless of their size or frequency of flow, are connected to downstream waters and strongly influence their function. And wetlands are integrated with rivers via functions that improve downstream water quality and buffer effects of pollution. Um, it would be short-sighted to um, go backward on this rule based on the science. Um, so I encourage you all to join the conversation about environmental protection and the importance of federally funded science. Uh, there's a 60-day comment period ahead on the new uh, proposal in case you're so inclined. I also wanted to mention that AGU has congressional visits day that they do collaboratively with other scientific societies four times a year, including one tomorrow. Um, I encourage you, if you're interested in learning how to speak with Congress, to Congress, participating in uh, reviews and these things, um, contact the AGU policy people and join up with the cause. Uh, there was also a report that came out with a consortium of aquatic science societies that clearly uh, made a statement about their view of uh, this rule. Aquatic scientists pushed back against narrow WOTUS rule. <laughs> uh, so I need to wrap up soon, but I wanted to end um, thinking about some multi-scale modeling challenges and opportunities. Um, one is the uh, need to describe vast heterogeneity, nonlinear processes, couplings, the whole works, um, and some emerging solutions, um, spatially explicit models, parameter, parameter and uncertainty estimation, multi-scale coupled models, and on and on. From my perspective, one of the big advances has been in the sharing of code and the sharing of data and the training that's available to learn how to use new things. That's been a real change in the last 10 years where you can go be taught by the best how to use some model that you could then link up with. This is a change in our community and a really valuable one. Um, back to the nutrient pollution theme. There's a lot of uncertainty um, with things that we don't know, but yet we already know a huge amount of things, like scientific consensus shows that if we reduce sources of nutrients, no matter what they are, deposition, fertilizers, manure, crops, um, that we will have environmental benefits in our water quality. No matter whose model you use, no matter what scale you use it at, inputs are related, maybe not so directly, but definitely um, and certainly not linearly, <laughs> but, but they're definitely related. Inputs are related to outputs. You reduce the inputs, you will reduce the outputs in stream flow, and on and on. So why haven't we been able to make progress? I'm going to stop there, but I wanted to end thinking about that one of the things we could do is try to get it into the public's um, mantra that water quality protection is cool. I've always thought instead of extreme makeover home edition, we need extreme makeover watershed edition to show people how we can go into one of these Chesapeake Bay catchments and do stuff and have it make an impact, even though we have to deal with lag times and all that good stuff. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Well, thank you, Beth, for a very inspiring talk. That was really excellent. We have time for a few questions. And uh, we have a microphone here. We can also just shout, and Beth can repeat the question. Who would like to start us off? Well, uh, Scott looks for hands. I will maybe kick off with a question just linked to uh, your comment about um, uh, mass balance accounting models. And I'm wondering how thinking is going in terms of you know, the, the new evidence of the age of streamwaters in the order of years or even decades 
and how one thinks about that in the traditional annual accounting model in terms of both water balance and kind of the mass balance you're talking about. Yeah, that's a good question, and my answers won't impress you much. One thing we do is we tend to look at things, you know, average, like for a certain year of inputs. But on the discharge side, we can look at long-term flow-weighted, detrended averages to relate things. One thing I can say, though, is that the question isn't necessarily the distribution of ages of water and water transport times, but the distribution of ages of water and transport pathways that are carrying the nitrogen. And nitrogen is very soluble. And one thing that we can see from experiments that were done accidentally, like countries running out of money to produce synthetic fertilizer and stopping use of it, is that very quickly you can see relationships between a decrease of putting something like fertilizer on the landscape and the benefits in the stream that might be more quick than a hydrologist would expect based on ages of water. So it's moving with the fast flows more so than with the slow flows. Um, and we might be able to mess around with um, egrets <laughs> to try to make some insights to those questions. Interesting. Thanks. Yeah, I think we have a question here. Thanks. Hi. I'm a big fan of open data. And I was, I was the person who shouted out when you talked about open data because I got so excited. Um, and uh, I wanted to know a little bit more about your experience with how open data has changed through time as well as what are the future things that we need to be overcoming right now. That's a good question. Um, there's so many different answers. It's very nuanced. Um, and it's also very frustrating. For example, I am trying to synthesize data on forested catchments. Inputs, outputs, wanting to redo loads, and even data that are supposed to be publicly available, and somewhat are. They're published through LTERs and CZOs and in ancillary information attached to supplemental information to a journal. It's very hard to pull together. And a lot of these data papers in the journals are just referring to data that's elsewhere and it takes months to pull together, even for a person who has a ton of experience with data wrangling. And so it would be nice. Uh, Kuwazi has helped tremendously, and it's catching on in our community to share data that way through Kuwazi. It's getting to be cool. I encourage you all to do it. Uh, they've made tools, they've made training, they've pulled together data, and they take an active initiative to try to link up with other groups like CZO to help the situation to pull information in. Um, on the other side, a bigger um, agency kind of information, the USGS and EPA and other agencies like USDA have been working hard to collaborate on making data availability better. But it takes time. And so I do believe it's going in the right direction, and I understand how challenging that is. But there's still a ton more work needed. But at least the uh, people in the agencies um, have the right collaborative spirit. Um, now, whether they'll get stymied based on funding <laughs> is another question. And the other thing I should mention that I wanted to mention is that in our programs, we're having to scale back on a lot of monitoring. Um, stream flow gauges, small catchments, programs within the USGS that cared about small catchments potentially going away, I'm not exactly clear, have gone away. Um, we need to be thinking about what we're losing, right, when we lose that kind of long-term site that's an important one, um, especially with conditions changing and needing the long-term record more than ever from a site that has a history of observation in order to understand the change. Yes, Mary. Hi. Um, I have two questions, actually. I'll go, they're not that hard, so I'll go ahead, or long. So I'll <laughs> just pose them both, and you can do with them as you please. Um, the first one is, do you think um, um, more recent irrigation practices that really try to use very little water will help in the nitrification part, and I, I the, the, the nitrate pollution part, and I, I see that it seems like it's happening in Kansas where I am, but I don't understand what's happening in Iowa at all, where it's wet. And, and the second question is the NAQA data site has an amazing wealth of pesticide data and other kinds of data, and do you see that moving forth and being involved in some analyses? Mm, good questions. Irrigation. Um, I think anything helps, right? If you're using less water for irrigation or you're using it um, more sensibly based on when the landscape actually needs it so you're not losing that extra water, it's got to help. I don't know about scaling. Like, I don't have a perspective being in Pennsylvania. We don't irrigate much, <laughs> not nearly as much as in Kansas anyway. Now, what was the other question? Pesticides. Um, there's a treasure trove of information, not 
of not just on pesticides, but on all sorts of emerging contaminants. I mean, how do you talk about the water quality of America's water in 30 minutes with all the things that we're interested in? But um, again, this consortium of agencies has been working hard to synthesize data and um, to make it available. Um, and the USGS itself has made excellent measurements of a whole host of types of pesticides and their metabolites in a systematic way, like knowing what they want to take a look at and has thought about that. And I think it's an undertapped resource. But if they're measuring it, it's now publicly available. 15 years ago, that wasn't the case. This is good. Thanks. I think we have to quit. Yeah, the next guy. we do. I'm, I'm sensitive to time. We have another session starting in five minutes. So I want to leave just a couple of minutes if you'd like to come down and, uh, and congratulate Brianna uh, Pagan, our Horton Research Grant winner, or come and uh, shake hands with Beth. And thank you for all coming. And uh, thank you, Beth. That was really